Hello, my name is Dr. Tyronda Elliott, and I am an attending physician here in the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. Today, I will be reviewing vasopressors and ionotropes. The learning objectives are twofold. First is to understand receptor activity of vasopressors and ionotropes, and second is to review the clinical indication for these drugs. Vasopressors and inotropes are cornerstone in the management of shock syndromes. Understanding vasopressor receptor activity and the resultant physiologic response enables clinicians to select the ideal vasopressor for a patient suffering from shock. As we go through, I will walk you through each drug and define its corresponding receptor affinity, in addition to the expected effect on systemic vascular resistance, or SVR, and cardiac output. Let's review the physiologic mechanisms of receptors. Alpha adrenergic receptors are located in the walls of the vascular smooth muscle and stimulation causes vasoconstriction. Beta adrenergic receptors are located in the heart. Stimulation causes both an increase of inotrophy and chronotrophy. Beta 2 adrenergic receptors are located in the blood vessels and induce vasodilatation. Additionally, beta-2 receptors are located in the lung, the liver, and in the pancreas, where stimulation will cause corresponding bronchodilatation, hepatic glycogenolysis, and also pancreatic release of glucagon. The many actions of vasopressin are mediated by stimulation of two different signaling pathways but for the purpose of our talk, we'll hone in on only a few of the different locations and their function. There are three main subtypes of vasopressin receptors, V1A, V1B, and V2. V1A receptors are located in the vascular smooth muscle. Stimulation causes vasoconstriction. V1B receptors are located in the anterior pituitary gland. Stimulation causes release of ACTH. And last, the V2 receptors are located in the renal collecting duct and stimulation will cause anti an antidiuretic effect. Dopamine receptors are also widespread, namely throughout the renal, splanchnic, coronary, and cerebral vascular beds. Stimulation of these receptors will cause vasodilatation. Now let's get back to our table. Here are the general profiles of the listed vasopressors. Let's start with norepinephrine brand name levofed. Norepinephrine increases vascular resistance, predominantly through stimulation of alpha-1. There's variable but often minimal responses on heart rate and cardiac contractility through beta-1, particularly at doses less than 0 0.2 mics per kilo per minute. Tachycardia may manifest as the dose escalates with a variable impact on cardiac contractility, which is largely dependent upon preload and resultant afterload. Phasopressin. Vasopressin at low doses, defined as less than 0.04 units per minute, increases vascular resistance predominantly through stimulation of V1. There is not substantial effect on either heart rate or cardiac contractility. It will demonstrate monofluid retention through V2 receptor stimulation, but this has little expected clinical relevance. Overall, you'll have an increase in SVR with a net effect of even on cardiac output. Epinephrine has a profile based upon the dose. So at low doses, you will see stimulation of beta-1 and beta-2 predominantly with increases in heart rate and cardiac contractility. There is minimal effect on vascular resistance at low doses of epinephrine. As the dose escalates, there's an increase in vascular resistance as we stimulate more alpha-1 receptors. Again, the overall physiologic response will be dependent upon preload and res resultant afterload. Clinically, norepinephrine is used very widespread. It's the first line vasopressor in vasodilatory shock via their surviving sepsis guidelines. Adverse effects include arrhythmias and digital ischemia. The SOAP-2 study was a randomized controlled trial comparing norepinephrine and dopamine as first-line agents in shock, published in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine. The results were twofold. 
first, the norepinephrine arm had a smaller incidence of arrhythmias and was also associated with the lower mortality in the cardiogenic shock subset, as illustrated in the figure on the right. Vasopressin. Their surviving sepsis guidelines actually recommends adding low-dose vasopressin as a norepinephrine sparing agent. However, the evidence behind this is weak and low quality. It may serve to restore catecholamine receptor responsiveness, particularly in patients that have severe metabolic acidosis. The VAST trial is worth mentioning. This trial compared norepinephrine versus norepinephrine and vasopressin in septic shock. The results showed that the addition of low-dose vasopressin to norepinephrine did not result in lower mortality. Clinically, epinephrine is used in vasodilatory shock, cardiac arrest, and anaphylaxis. Their surviving sepsis guidelines recommends the addition of epinephrine to norepinephrine to achieve a targeted MAP. Again, this is weak low-quality evidence. Epinephrine may stimulate glycolysis, thus increasing serum glucose and lactate production, which may limit the utility of monitoring lactate clearance. Let's move on to a couple other drugs. So phenylephrine with the brand name neosinephrine has pure alpha agonist activity and therefore results in vasoconstriction. There's minimal effect on cardiac inotrophy or chronotrophy. As there's an increase in vascular resistance, it often, le often leads to a decrease in heart rate mediated by the carotid baroreceptor reflex. The cardiac output may vary widely, largely dependent upon both preload and afterload. Dopamine's profile is dose dependent. At low doses, it has a very low effect on restoring hemodynamics as the, the affinity to the DA receptors predominate. As the dose escalates, you'll see an increase in heart rate and cardiac contractility through stimulation through beta-1. At the higher end of the dose range, you'll also include alpha-1 stimulation, thereby increasing vascular resistance. Clinically, their surviving sepsis guidelines do not make rated recommendations on the use of phenylephrine, given its limited clinical trial data. You might see it added as a third or fourth line vasopressor in patients who are having profound circulatory collapse. It's a reasonable strategy to give to patients who are particularly susceptible to beta adrenergic generated arrhythmias. Adverse effects of phenylephrine include reflex, bradycardia, or tissue necrosis with extravasation. It's very important to use a central line when you are employing phenylephrine as a medication choice. Dopamine. Their surviving sepsis guidelines recommend dopamine as an alternative to norepinephrine if there's an absolute or relative bradycardia. This is weak low quality evidence. It does not recommend the use of dopamine for renal protection. The main adverse effect of dopamine includes arrhythmias. Let's switch gears just a bit and talk about inotropes. Isopaternal is primarily an inotropic and chronotrophic agent rather than a vasopressor. It acts upon beta-1 receptors and has a prominent chronotrophic effect. The drug's high affinity for beta-2 adrenergic receptors causes vasodilatation and also will decrease the arterial pressure. Therefore, its utility in hypotensive patients is quite limited. Dobutamine is an inotrope that causes vasodilatation. Dobutamine's predominant beta-1 adrenergic receptor activity increases inotrophy and chronotrophy and also reduces left ventricular filling pressures. However, the minimal alpha and beta-2 adrenergic receptor effects will result in overall vasodilatation. The net effect of dobutamine is increased cardiac output with decreases in systemic vascular resistance with or without a reduction in blood pressure. Lastly, milrinone is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that acts via the cyclic AMP pathway. This is a non adrenergic drug that has both inotrophic and vasodilatory effects. In many ways, its effects are very similar to those of dobutamine. The main difference is that there's a lower incidence of dysrhythmias when using milrinone. How do we use these drugs clinically? The American Heart Association recommends consideration of isopaterenol in patients that have cardiogenic shock secondary to bradycardia. Unfortunately, the drug's expense has introduced a need to consider cost-effectiveness 
Dobutamine is most frequently used in patients that have severe medically refractory heart failure or cardiogenic shock. This drug should not be used routinely in, in septic shock because of the risk of hypotension. The adverse effects of dobutamine include hypotension and tachycardia. Milrion is also used in the treatment of medically refractory heart failure. It's excreted almost exclusively through the renal system, therefore should be used with caution in patients that have chronic kidney disease. Generally, there is not a single preferred basal active therapy, and the strategy that you employ to treat these patients that have circulatory shock depend upon the etiology of the shock, and secondly, upon the patient's clinical presentation. Your fluid and vasoactive strategies are often going to be guided by a dynamic bedside exam in addition to invasive monitoring devices that enable optimization of preload, afterload, pulmonary, and systemic vascular resistance. I'd like to conclude with a few points. First, understanding vasopressor receptor activity and the resultant physiologic response is imperative in managing patients that have shock. The clinical efficacy is demonstrated by targeted hemodynamic variables, while application remains driven by patient physiology. Most of the guidelines that we have regarding management of shock are focused on distributive shock. And last, the utility of a vasopressor is often a function of the familiarity of the physician managing it. And those that are most informed about the benefits, the risk, the dose range, the interactions, and the adverse effects. Keep these things in mind as you go forward and treat patients with shock. Thank you.